Good morning, cowboys and cowgirls for Jesus. Good morning. Amen. How many of you glad to be in church this morning? It's a whole lot better than being in the hospital, huh? Amen. Did I do that? Huh? Oh, maybe not. Yes and yes. I didn't do it. We love you anyway. Um, how many of y'all were here last Sunday? Did you think that was a great sermon? It was, wasn't it? How many of you uh, really felt like it spoke to you to partner with God? Oh, all three of you, gosh. <laughs> Four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I was really stirred by that sermon, as I, as I generally am when Dennis preaches. And uh, I, I don't know if all preachers are like me, but, but when I sit under, under Dennis or somebody else, uh, I have to fight to keep my mouth shut because, you know, they get me fired up and I just want to join in. But, but I resist most of the time. Anyway, uh, I want to pray today and... Uh, I want you to pray for me for this word that it comes out the way God wants it while I'm praying. Would you do that? Father, I thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. I thank you for these people that you brought today, Father. And I pray that you brought them to hear this word, Father. And I just ask you to take charge of, of this, this service, take charge of me and my mouth, Father, and, and my thoughts. And Lord, make this, this message come out the way you want it and the way you intended it. And uh, just give us ears to hear, Father, this morning. I, I think it's a message from you, Father. And I just ask you to give us ears to hear, including me, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, I don't know uh, how, how many of y'all, uh, how many of y'all will tell me the truth if I ask you a question? Okay, it's, it's not a trick question, really. Uh, how many of y'all have an opinion? <laughs> There's a few that don't. Uh, I probably need uh, just an opinion. How many of you have an opinion and you know it? How many of you have an opinion about different things in the Bible? How many of you have an opinion about uh, how, you, how far you're going to go in life? And how successful you're going to be in life or other things. How many of you feel, now this is, this is the real question that I wanted to work up to. How many of you feel that, um, that your, your life in some way, whether it's work or church or spiritual things or, or friends and relationships, how many of you feel like that there's something that's just kind of inhibiting you from fully coming to where you need to be or want to be. Anybody? That's a pretty good representation, and I see a couple nodding and not raising their hand. Well, what do you think is the, uh, is the biggest limiting factor that keeps you from achieving what God's purpose is for your life or what your desire is for your life? How many of you know what, what's inhibiting you? You do. Well, I wish that I could just, you know, let you speak out and tell me what it is. Would you like to know what the single biggest limiting factor is in our lives, in my opinion? It's your opinions. <laughs> Whatever you have an opinion of, and particularly when it comes to Scripture, and, and you know, I used to teach a Bible study at my office in, when I was in business in San Antonio, and it was a mixed group, and it was voluntary, but I taught it uh, once a week. And uh, they'd come, and, and they were mostly non-Christians. And uh, some of them were Catholics, some of them were Lutherans, and just, a, you know, just an array of people. And as I would teach, they would say, well, that's not what I think. And they would say, well, that's not what my priest says. Or they would say, uh, that just doesn't seem right to me. You know, my opinion's different from that. Uh, 
And, and I always told them, well, what's more important? You know, what you think, what the priest said, or what God said? And, and what I want to message I want to get across to you today before I start on a message is that, is that your opinion of what God says can get in the way of you hearing the real truth. Because if your opinion's strong, how many of you have strong opinions? Well, the stronger your opinion is, the more it'll limit you. Because most of our opinions, let me just tell you what an opinion is. Uh, an opinion is a belief or judgment that rests on insufficient grounds to produce a complete certainty. Hello? This is the, the dictionary, uh, not the Bible dictionary, just the dictionary. An opinion is a belief or judgment that rests on insufficient grounds to produce a complete certainty. In other words, it's just an opinion, and it's just as likely or more likely to be wrong than it is right. We learn things as we're growing up. We learn things from the time we can talk and, and remember until the time we die. And, and if you don't learn them from the scriptures, from God's word, it's likely as not incorrect. Uh, at, least, at least a high percentage of the time, and, and things we learned at early age are, are very likely incorrect. And if you accept it as truth, and then somebody else tells you something different, you're not going to hear that because you've already formed an opinion about it, and you already accepted that opinion as truth. And can you see where that can lead you astray? Can you see particularly where the scriptures are concerned that it could, it could close your eyes to some of God's truth because you learned it a different way a long time ago? Well, I just wanted to throw that out there for, for your consideration. Um, but that has nothing to do with the message today. Well, it really does, but uh, uh, I, I want to preach today. Uh, I've got three topics or three points, and I'm going to tell you what they are ahead of time so you won't get lost, okay? And I don't know if I'll get all the way through or not because uh, God gave me a bunch of scriptures as I wrestled through what stirred up in me last week, and I, I didn't know for sure what to title it, but it's, it's a follow-up on what Dennis did, and his was... Uh, uh, partnering with God in promises. And I first thought, well, I'll do uh, partnering with God in, in miracles or partnering with God in something else. But, but as, I, as I got the scriptures that God was putting in my head together, I, I, I called it, we'll see what it comes out as, but I called it partnering with God in life. And, and I think that's really getting close to the bottom line. But uh, anyway, I've got three, three topics God uses men, and, and be, be still, ladies, men is, is not, you know, uh, it's men and women. When God says men, most of the time he's talking about mankind. Uh, occasionally not. But, uh, but so God uses men, and why? And number two is, which men does he use the most? And number three is, what are the qualifications for being used? How many of you want to be used by God? That's most of us. How many of you feel like you're being used by God to, to, the, to, the, to the most he can right now? That's fewer, a lot fewer, amen? There's a couple of the kind of limp hands, but uh, what we all want to be used, I think. So anyway, let's start with, uh, with Genesis. God uses, God uses men and why? Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, I can read down here better than up there. Then God said, let's make men in our image uh, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. See, him refers to both. Uh, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And... Uh, so he, he gave man the authority over the earth. And, and if you came to the Bible study this morning, uh, you learned that, uh, that, that he gave us complete authority over the earth. You know, he put us in charge of the earth. 
And uh, how many of you know that's true? Uh, I would say all of what God does, but, but I, I can't do that because God is, is, can do whatever he wants to. But for the most part, if not all, when God does something on the earth, it happens through a man or a woman. You agree with that? Um, so, so if we know that we have the responsibility that God gave us, and he gave us the responsibility to subdue this earth and to, to uh, be in charge of it, uh, have dominion over it, uh, let, let's see John, 5, John 5, verse 19, and see uh, what Jesus said about it. Uh, in John 5, verse 19, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son of Man can do uh, whatever he wants to all by himself. No? He said, The Son of Man can do nothing of himself. Now, this is Jesus. This is God that took on bodily human form and came to this earth as a man. Okay? He said, I can do nothing of myself. But what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. Are you listening? Uh, it says, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Remember that, okay? That he, he's gonna sh he said, Jesus will show greater works than these that, that we would marvel at them. You got that? So, so if Jesus only did what his father was doing and what he saw his father doing and what the father told him to do, if that's all he did, uh, what about us? Hello? Look at John 14. Uh, verse 12. Did I mess you up somewhere? I'm sorry. It's always my fault. I must have wrote one down wrong or something. Okay. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus again. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the, work, the works that I do, he will do also. He is, is us. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus is going to do whatever we ask him to do. Is that what that said? Uh, he, he, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Who's going to be the doing of it? Huh? No, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do. Where does he live? What? He lives in us. So how's, who's he going to do it through? Us. us. But he's going to be the one that does it. That's what it says. It says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, you know, we're more than, than conquerors. We're overcomers. Why do you suppose that is? It's because Jesus lives in us. It's because he wants to work through us. And because if we, if we pay attention to his word and to his scriptures, to the things he wrote, he's going to do a lot of things, I think, more than he's doing now because I don't think that, that enough of us or maybe any of us have the full concept. And it's probably un, uh, impossible for us to, we can't, comprehend his fullness and all of his majesty because it's so far above us but if we can just comprehend a greater percentage of the things he put in the word that we can understand and if we don't understand something you know the scripture says in I think it's in Proverbs it says that uh, it's, it's the pleasure of uh, maybe I'm just quoting this it's paraphrased don't hold me to the letter of it but it says that uh, it's, God's, it's God's pleasure to hide something from the king and he gets, he gets pleasure out of watching him search it out. 
Are y'all, any of y'all familiar with that scripture? I didn't say it exactly right, I don't think, but that's the general gist of it. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of things in the Word that God wants us to search out. He put them in there and he hid them so that just anybody wouldn't see them. That's why he talked in parables when he, when he came here on earth because everybody wasn't supposed to understand. But the ones that search for him, he will let you find him. And if you search for him in, his, in the word, he will let you find it and he will reveal it to you. And, uh, and I don't, you know, more of us need to, to be more diligent about that because there's things I believe in this word that we're right on the, the verge of learning that, that God's going to use. And, and I think when he starts using them and, and when, when we start getting all that, knowing all that we're supposed to know to, to allow him to work through us, I think we're going to start seeing some more miracles and some, some, some greater things than Jesus did. I can't imagine what that will be or what it's like. Can you? You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, we have more capabilities to talk to more people, and that, that's why it will be greater. Well, I don't know why it's going to be greater, but he said greater works than these we will do. Amen? So I'm for finding out what they are and, and, and how we can, can walk in that more fully. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 16. says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible or invisible. How, you, how many of you know there's two, two levels in, in this earth? There's visible and invisible. Amen? And, and we see the visible all the time. We got to learn to see the invisible better, okay? Uh, but he created all things that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all of it, all things were created through him and for him. How many of y'all are, are a thing, you know? I mean, how many of y'all are, are something that he created? Did he create you? You know, we tend to think we were born, but we weren't born. We were created before the foundations of the earth. God set it all in action. He, he's over all of it. He did it all, and he caused all of it to happen. Amen? And, and he put us here to make some things happen through us. And I think we're not quite holding up our end. I don't mean to be negative about it, but I just think that, that God wants us to go further. Amen? Anybody agree with that? Good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, Anyway, things, um, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him all things may have preeminence. See, he, he wants us to do it, but he wants to get all the credit for it. Amen. And if we give him the credit for it, and we learn a few more things, I think we'll start seeing more works of his through us. And I think that's what he wants. And that's what I think this message is about today, okay? We'll see where it goes. And there's probably not any way I'm going to get through with it in one, in one pass, but I'm just going to go where he leads me, okay? Um, verse 19 says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether these things on earth, things in heaven, having been made peace through the blood of his cross. So he did it all. He provided for all of it. He paid the price for our sins. And, and that's the only way that we can have him living in us is because he paid the price for our sins and he forgave all of our sins. And, and if you look at Hebrews, I think it's... Uh, Chapter 9, verse 27 or somewhere around there, it says he's coming again to those who are looking for him without regard to sin. How many of you are glad about that? Maybe you didn't hear that right. It says he's coming again to those that are actively looking for his return without regard to sin. Do you want him to come back without regard to sin or you want him to come back and look and see how many times you sinned lately? Okay. That wasn't quite as what I expected, but if that's the best y'all can do, that's what, you want to try it one more time? He's coming out, coming back without regard to sin. All right, all right, hallelujah. That's what I expected. And we better be glad that that's how he's coming back. Amen? Um, uh, 
And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I think somebody's not catching on to this. I'll read that again. Uh, <laughs> And, and you who once were alienated, how many of you know you were alienated until the point that you, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yeah. You know, and if you're here today and you haven't accepted him yet and you don't have a relationship with him, you're, you're kind of alienated from him. You don't really know him. And we'll give you an opportunity today to fix that if, if you want to, okay? But it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. I know I repeated that. And you know, and, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. That's past tense. He has reconciled. If you've trusted him, he has reconciled uh, in the body of his flesh through his death so that he could present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's how Jesus sees you. That's how God sees you, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Amen? Amen. And, and it doesn't matter what you did yesterday or last week or last month or 45 years ago. Nothing matters. That's the way he sees you once, he, once you come to him and accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, became a minister. That, that's a, a lot of stuff, guys, right there. If we could put that on our refrigerators and put it in our heart and put it in our brain and, and remember it all the time, it would take care of some of our opinions. Amen? Some of you need to check, some of us need to check our opinion of what he thinks about us. That is so important that you don't have an opinion, a wrong opinion, about how God sees you and how he thinks of you. Because if you have a wrong opinion about that, you are limited in more ways than you can count. Amen? Amen. Look at John 15, 5. This is Jesus again. How many of y'all like it when Jesus talks? Amen. How many of you listen better when Jesus is talking? You shouldn't because all word is profitable for for reproof, for, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. All of God's word is good for instruction in righteousness. So uh, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Without him you can do nothing. I know sometimes we get to thinking we can do stuff, and, and usually it's because he did something through us and we thought we had something to do with it. But if he's ministering through you and if he's living in you and you're surrendering to him, everything you do that's worth anything, he did it. He did it. And we need to give him the credit. And if you once start thinking that you did something, then um, you, better, you better repent and say, Lord, you know, I know that was you and, and I don't want to take credit for it. I want you to have all the credit. And, uh, and if this sermon's any good today, it's him. It isn't me. If it's bad, it's probably me. But, but, uh, but he does it. Um, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And verse 7 says, again, it repeats it. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. How many of you? How many of you think? Well, you know, I don't think he's going to supply some of my desires. But if you're living in him and abiding in him, and his words abiding in you, your desires are going to be his desires. Amen. So I used to think when it says God works all things together for those that love it, that that lo those that love him and are called uh, according to his purpose. Uh, he works them for good. I used to think that was my good, but it's not. 
He works all things together for his good, but if it's for his good, then it's good for me too. Amen? Amen? And that's what this is talking about. Um, By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Uh, Are y'all getting any of this? I mean, is it it ringing any bell to you that, that he wants to work through us? He wants to do the work, but he wants us to do it. And that's what he put us on earth for, was to do what he wants us to do. And, and how many of you think if we start doing what he wants to do, we can change the world, at least our part of it? Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 12. Um, this is Paul, again. Uh, he says, I know how to be abased. And I know how to be abound, how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Can we do all things through Christ who strengthens us? Yes. We can, but we have to be diligent about working through his word. We have to be diligent about listening to his voice. We have to be diligent to to get our focus right and to get it on him and to get rid of our opinions. You know, if, if the only opinion we have is his opinion, how many of you think the world would be better off? Hello? If half of us had his opinions, do you think the world would be better off? I don't know about y'all, but I'm trying to get my opinions out of the way. I want God's opinion and God's truth, and, and I want to see what God does with it then. Um, what was that last scripture I read? No, 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 no. I, I know where it is. I want to know what it is. All right, let's do it all together one time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Y'all said that to yourself, so I want you to remember it, okay? Uh, we need to start, we need to start acting like we believe that. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 9. What's, what's, what, you know, the guy said, Lord, teach us to pray. And what, what, did, what, did, what did he say, you know? Just the first part of it. He says, our Father, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed will be your name. That, that means that, that God will be praised. He'll be glorified. We'll, we'll attribute everything to him. We'll give him credit for everything he does. Hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Where? On earth, On earth as it is Where? By whom? Us. We are the ones that are supposed to bring heaven to earth by allowing Jesus that lives in us to work through us and cause us to do the things that he wants to do. Anybody believe that? Weak, 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 weak. Does anybody believe that? That's better. I'm going to wake you all up before it's over. Might not be over till next week. Uh so anyway, that's, that's part one, just, just to, to prove that he did not prove, but just to, to, to show he, he put us here to use us. He put us here to, to subdue the earth. He put us here to, to let him live through us and for us to accomplish his purposes. That's what he put us here for. But, but we have a part, and, and we have to, to get ready. So, so part two is, uh, is which men does he use? Did, did, we, did we sufficiently establish that God really works through us and that's the main way that he works and that he wants us to, to allow him to work through us and accomplish the things that he wants done? Amen. That's why we have to let this mind that's in him be in us. Amen? That's why we have to hide the word in our heart uh, so that we, we know what, how he thinks and what he does. We have to get to know his character and his nature before we can can be where we need to be. So which men does he use? He uses those that, Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. Uh, they ask him, you know, what were the greatest commandments? And in verse 37, you know what they are, don't you? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. Uh, and I don't think you can go to the second part of that until you get that part right. And, and I know a lot of us, including myself, think that we love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. But do we really? Do we act like that? You know, you know what love is? And who knows what love is? 
Love is how you act. It's acting right. It's acting the way God says to act. So what that really says is you shall act right to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Do we do that? Hello? Do we? Any of us all the time? I know we can't do it all the time, but what percentage of the time we do it? It depends on how much time you spend in the Word. It depends on how, many, how much time you spend talking to Him and listening to Him. And many times we talk too much. How many of you have a friend that talks all the time? <laughs> do you ever get to talk? You do, you, and, and if they talk all the time, do you really listen? Hello? Well, see, God needs to do as much of the talking or more of the talking than we do, you know. We just praise him a little and, and let him know we're really trying our best to love him and we want to know him better and we want to love him and we want to honor him and we want to glorify him and then shut up and listen. He'll tell you how. He'll tell you what scriptures to go to. He'll, he'll start putting it in your heart if you start listening. But what happens if you listen and you hear him and you don't do it? What's it say about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only? What's it say about being a double-minded man? He's unstable in all his ways. Hello? Are y'all out there? Okay. I'm just making sure. Um, the second part of that, and the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many of you think you can do that if you don't do number one? You cannot love your neighbor as yourself correctly and fully unless you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And even then you have to go further than that. You have to realize that the blood of Jesus takes away the sins of your neighbor if he's saved as well as it does you. And if you see your neighbor doing something and you judge him, then God says, as you judge, so shall you be judged. And, and the biggest thing in, in, in us loving our neighbor is our opinions. Hello? Seriously, you think that might be true? What's your opinion of your neighbor? If you've got a bad opinion of your neighbor, and if your neighbor's saved especially, then uh, you aren't going to think right about him. You aren't going to love him. You aren't gonna, you're going to criticize whatever you think, whatever your opinion is. What if he's lost and you've got an opinion of him? Sure is quiet. If he's lost and you've got an opinion of him, what's that opinion? Is that opinion going to help you witness to him? Is it going to help you love him? Is it gonna, we're, we're supposed to love our, our enemies too, you know, so even if he's unsaved, even if he's whatever that your opinion is of him, you're still supposed to love him, aren't you? You can't do it if you have the wrong opinion of him, and you can't have the right opinion of him unless you know God's word. And then regardless of what, your, what God's opinion is of him or what he's doing, you're supposed to love him. You're supposed to act right towards him. You're not supposed to, to criticize him. You're not supposed to, to talk harsh to him. You're not supposed to tell him all of his faults. You're supposed to tell him about Jesus. And you're supposed to set an example in your life so that he sees Jesus in you. And that way when he gets fed up with his life, he's going to come to you in all likelihood and he's going to say, Hey, man, my life's just not going good and yours seems to be going great. What's the difference? And I'm going to say, hoo man, let me tell you. Let me tell you what the difference is. The difference is Jesus. He's my personal Savior. He's my friend. He's, he's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He wants to live through me. And, and that's what he's doing right now because you're asking me, and I'm going to let him live through me. He's going to be talking to you. He's going he's to have me tell you about him. Amen? Amen? That's where we need to be. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. You know, so many people worry about keeping the law and keeping the Ten Commandments and stuff. If you just love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and your neighbor as yourself, you'd never have to give it a thought. Amen. You'd automatically be a slave to righteousness. Look at James 2, verse 18. We talk a lot about faith, you know. And uh, how many of you have faith? How do you know you have faith? The word says so. Does it? Yes. Okay. Well, let's look at James 2.18. It said, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Do you have any works? 
If you say you have faith and you have no works, does your faith save you? We need to talk about this maybe. So show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, do you think you can work enough to, to get saved? Do you think you can work enough to make God pleased with you and say, well done, good and faithful servant? You can't. You can't work your way into anything with God. Amen? But if you have the spirit of the living God living in you, if you've trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and he lives in you, works have to come out. But they're not works that you have to do. They're works that you do because he's in you and he's doing the work through you. This is what this is talking about. It's talking about, we, you know, a lot of people say, well, I got faith. Well, faith has an action. If, you believe, if I believe this chair will hold me up, I'll sit in it. I'll even stand on it if I believe it holds me up. I might fall, but I'll stand on it if I believe it will hold me up. And, and, if, and if it's a rickety old chair and I don't think it will hold me up, I won't sit in it. I can say, yeah, I have, that chair will hold me up, but I ain't going to sit in it. Is that faith? So God says, I'll work through you, and, and you go do this. And I say, well, I know you will, and I got faith, but not for me. That's not for me to do. Do you believe you can do all things through him that strengthens you? Do you believe everything he says? Faith believes and then faith acts. It acts. It, it, it has an action to it. And that is how God knows that we really have faith. Not because we do it to gain something, but because we do it because he's in us, because he's guiding us and directing us and we're doing what he tells us. That shows him that we really believe and we really have the faith. Amen? You show me your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you, you got to listen to this, okay? But do you know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Are y'all reading that right? Did I read it right? I just picked up on this yesterday. Do you know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That's not what it says. What does it say? Now, you just think about that for a minute. Do you really want to know that, works, that, that faith without works is dead? I never noticed that want to in there before. I just noticed it yesterday when I was going over this again. Do you really want to, and I highlighted it big and bold so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, do you really want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Why would you not want to know that? Works is whatever God does through you that, that profits somebody else's life. Works is, is doing, well, the, the, they asked Jesus, they said, what are the works of God? And he said, first of all, to believe on me, to believe on him who sent me. You believe on God and you believe that Jesus was his son. That's the work of, of a Christian. The first thing is to believe that Jesus is the son of God and that God sent him. But once we get him living inside us, he wants to work through us. So anything he does... Uh, you, you're, you're doing the sound system up there, and you're good at it. Amen? God brought you here partly for that purpose. When you're doing that, you're making us all able to hear the gospel and to hear the preaching, no matter whether it's good or bad, you're making us hear it. And, and that's the works of, of God. You're doing that because you're doing it for God. If you were just up there doing it so we'd all make accolades over you and praise you and stuff like that, then that'd be the only reward you'd ever get. But if you're doing it for him so that we can hear, so that we can grow, then that's the works of God. Does that make it, does that make it understandable? Yes. Amen. And you do a lot of works for God. When you stood up here the other night and gave your testimony, that was the works of God because you were doing it for him. Amen? Amen. Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to get across. <laughs> Amen. That's what I'm trying to get across is we have to work for him and allow him to work through us. Uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? See, offering Isaac didn't get him anything. He was just doing what God told him. 
And then God didn't even make, let him go through with it. God made another way. But he proved to God through that. He, didn't, he, didn't, he proved to himself, really. God already knew what he was going to do. But and when God tests us, uh, it's as much for us to know what we, what we are and what we do as it is for God to know. Because how many of you know God knows everything? He knows the end from the beginning and the front from the back and the top from the bottom. He knows it all. There's nothing we can tell God. Uh, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Accounted to him for righteousness means he didn't earn it by, by pretending to go, th- by, by, by going right up to the knife in, in his son. See, that, that's, he, that's, that's not what got him righteousness. Righteousness is because God accounted it to him as righteousness. And that's, that, how many of y'all are righteous? How many of you got there by being good enough to be righteous, be called righteous by God? Some of you didn't raise your hand. You got to know that the only way you can be your righteousness that you do and your works and your flesh is filthy rags. And there's some more descriptive things that you could use for that that I'm not even going to talk about. But it says our righteousness to God is like filthy rags. So you can't be good enough to be better than filthy rags in your own. But when you got Jesus in you and you surrender to him, and you let him live through you, then you are, you're not just kind of righteous, you are righteous, and you may not look righteous to me even, because we don't act right all the time to each other. We're supposed to, and the more you know that he made you righteous, the more righteous you're going to act. And the more you know that he forgave all of your sins, the more righteous you're going to act. But in his eyes, no matter what you do, you are right now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and, and unless, unless you run away, so shall you ever be. Amen. It doesn't come in and out. It, you know, if you do something bad tomorrow, uh, it doesn't, your righteousness doesn't go away. First John says, he, if, if you're faithful and confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And you can only be cleansed of all unrighteousness one time or you didn't get cleansed from all of it. Amen. Amen. That's worth more than that, y'all. Like Dennis said, I'm preaching better than y'all are listening. It's okay for me to copy you every once in a while, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Well, I told you I wouldn't get through. Uh, It was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. The the works don't justify you. The faith justifies you, but the works prove it. That's the way I interpret it, and that's the way I get it in my mind so that I can understand it and, and don't think that he expects me just to work. He wants to do the work. He wants to do the work through me. Um. Oh, my goodness. Anybody get anything out of this so far? How many of y'all going to come back next week because this is only half a message? Some of you aren't coming back. Matter of fact, hold on. Let's do that again. How many of you coming back next week and get the rest of it? Okay. (laughs) Well, I'm telling you, the rest of it, I mean... I was, I'm still astonished at the way God put it together and, and where it goes. And I hope that everybody will come back next week. But uh, I, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to quit right there because if I, if I keep going, I, I, won't, I won't stop. Uh, God's really got me excited about what he's, what he's showing me here. And I, I pray that you'll come back and get excited with me. And, uh, and, and it'll help me, you know, if you get a little bit more excited, uh, you know. Is that, that's not wrong, is it? Uh, I just, I just, you know, there may be some here that that uh, that have never trusted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, and there may be some here that have trusted Him, but never fully surrendered to Him. You know, we can come to Him and then get sidetracked and get uh, our eyes on the wrong things, on the things of the world, and uh, and we can have our opinions all messed up too. You know. So I just want to give you an opportunity this morning. First of all, if you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you don't know for sure that if you died tonight that you'd go to heaven, uh, I'd really like to pray with you. I'd really like to just lead you in a prayer to introduce you to my Lord Jesus Christ 
So if that's you, would you just lift your hand wherever you are? And just, I'm not going to call you up here and embarrass you or anything. I'm just going to I'm just going to pray a prayer, and you can pray it with me. Amen. I see one. Anybody else? You don't even have to pray it out loud. You can if you want to, but you can pray it in your heart and in your mind. That's the important part. Anybody else? Well, just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Father, if never before, right this minute, I want to turn my life over to you. I know Jesus is the Son of God. I know he died on the cross for me. And if never before, right now, I choose to trust you as my personal Lord and Savior. And I ask you to, to live in me and start working through me like this guy's been talking about. And I ask you to just teach me what I need to know about you. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I, the people that prayed that prayer, I just ask you to fill them with your spirit. I ask you to pour your anointing on them. I ask you to stir up in them a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and for your word, Father. And, Lord, I ask you to begin to guide them in every decision they make and everything that they do, Father. And just fill them with your joy. Fill them with your peace. And get them excited about you, Father. And let them, let them make a 100% commitment to you, Father. And just start hungering to, and thirsting after you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there may be others, there may be others that, uh, that have not been where we've been talking about. Maybe, maybe you know that maybe God's been dealing with you about your opinions, and you want to get your opinions right and be sure that they're right. And, and you want to get more surrendered to God and get him more in charge of your life. If that's you, I'd like to pray with you also. Anybody in that category that just wants me to pray for them and wants to pray with me? Anybody, anywhere? There's one. Anybody else? There's two. Amen. There's three. Amen. Four, five. All right, we just wait a minute. Six. <laughs> okay. Whether you raise your hand or not, if you want to, pray this prayer with me. Just say, Father, I so want to, to know you better. And I so want you to work through me. So I ask you to stir up in me more of a hunger and a thirst for your word and for your righteousness. Father, help me to listen for your voice and help me to do what you say when I hear your voice, Father. Lord, just guide me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody glad they came to church today besides me?